Um, if you're like me, there are times in your life where you just wish you had a sign, where you just wish you had proof, like you're about to make a decision, and you just wish that God would show you something, like, God, send me a rainbow, or, you know, some thunder, lightning, whatever you got to do. I just need some help, like I need some proof. Maybe you're trying to buy a house, or a car, or uh, change, considering a career change, or moving, what, what not. Or maybe you're just considering actually going out with that dude who has asked you out. And if you're looking for a sign, well, you actually, that's probably your sign, that you probably don't need to, but we'll talk about that. In the series that begins next week, and and uh, but we're always looking for a sign. I have this kind of life hack that I wanted to share with you guys on Easter 2023. I think it's significant. Uh, when I'm looking for a sign, when I'm looking for proof, I go to P.F. Chang's. I go to P.F. Chang's uh, because they have fortune cookies there, and um, it's amazing the information that you can get from a cookie. And I just wanted to share a few, you know, insights that I've received over the years from fortune cookies uh, here on the screen. This is one that I found to be significant and so true, especially if you eat a lot of rice. You know what I'm saying? You're going to be hungry again in a little bit. But that's not all. We have a, we have a couple more for you to share. Um, if you eat something and nobody sees you eat it, it has no calories. And I know that that sets some of y'all free, Right? Because I know we got some closet eaters up in the house, and it sets you, sets, you, sets you free. And then the third one that I think is very powerful, like really, really introspective. You should think, think over this. To truly find yourself, you should play hide and seek alone. There's some power there, y'all. I really don't go to P.F. Chang's and I'm looking for direction. But there are certainly times when we're looking for proof. It isn't there. And I think that the event that we celebrate this weekend is an event that is just one of those signs. Like it is irrefutable proof. In fact, the event that we celebrate this weekend, I believe, addresses most questions about Christianity. Because, uh, and this will set some of you free, this will, be, this will be good news for some. Christianity is not built on the foundation of Christians. Uh, Christianity is not built even on a list of, of rules or regulations. Christianity is, and stay with me, not even built on the foundation of the teachings of Jesus. Not, not of the miracles of Jesus. As amazing as the teachings of Jesus were and still are for us today, as life-giving as they are, they were so countercultural then and now, but they were so countercultural in the first century, they never, likely never would have even made it out of that first century. We, we wouldn't even know about the miracles of Jesus were it not for the event that we celebrate today. And, and, and I think actually Easter addresses something that there is no plausible explanation for. If you're looking for proof, if you're looking for sign, and that is the existence of the church. Because you've got to understand, y'all, that when, when Jesus died on the cross, the hope of his followers died with him. Like he was the centerpiece of the message. If you're not sure about that, all you got to do is go and read. You'll find the disciples uh, after the crucifixion hiding. Like they're, they go and close the door and lock it behind them, and they gather together because they believe that they might be crucified as well. You, you find two guys on, walking away from Jerusalem who were downtrodden, who were downcast, who were broken because the centerpiece of their hope had just been crucified. So, how is it? That we are here today. How is it that billions of people around the world will gather? In fact, I've heard it, some say that some one third of the world's population will gather this weekend to celebrate the life of a Jewish carpenter that only lived just over 33 years and was only in the public eye for just over three years. How did the church survive his death? Well, because the death wasn't the end of the story. And in Luke chapter 24, and as a matter of fact, this story that we're talking about today shows up in all four Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament, which were all stories of the life of Jesus according to four different men. This story shows up in all four Gospels. It was not written like fairy tale 
or folklore. As a matter of fact, it was full of details. And in Luke's account, Luke says that early on that Sunday morning, the ladies came to the tomb to properly prepare the body of Jesus for burial. The reason they came to do that is because the men had buried Jesus on Friday night very quickly. And how many of you know men never get it right anyway? And so the women had to come behind them and get it right. They came to prepare his body because they did not believe he was going to resurrect. The disciples did not believe that there would be a resurrection. Like no one was hiding in the bushes on that first resurrection morning. And just as the sun was coming over the horizon, nobody started a countdown. Ten, nine, eight. No one did that because they were not expecting Jesus to resurrect. But when those women got to the tomb and they saw the stone rolled away, And they found no body. Two angels appeared to them and asked them, Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He is not here. He has risen from the dead. He's alive. He's alive. And that empty tomb is why we're here today. That empty tomb is the reason that Christianity exists as it does today. If you pull the resurrection out of Christianity, it completely deflates it. The empty tomb is the reason we know the miracles of Jesus. We know the teachings and the message of Jesus. As a matter of fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I love to read this every Easter. um, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. This is the gospel. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And after his resurrection, verse 5 says, he started appearing to people. Like he had been dead, then he was alive. And after he came back to life, it wasn't like one person saw it and wrote about it. All kinds of people saw Jesus resurrected. He appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and the sisters at the same time. And then Paul goes on to say, most of whom are actually still living. So when Paul penned this, this letter to the church in Corinth... He said, the story I'm telling you about Jesus appearing to 500, at the time of writing, most of those people are actually still alive. Like he was so sure of it. He's like, go fact check me if you want to. Go see. Those people are still alive. They saw him alive. Then he appeared to James. Then to all the apostles. Verse 8, and last of all, he appeared to me also. Verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is useless. The resurrection is the foundation, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we've testified about God that Christ raised him, that, that, that Christ raised from the dead, that he raised Christ from the dead. I should say I've read that only seven times this weekend already. I should be able to get it right, right? Listen, the, fa- the, the, the resurrection is the foundation of who we are and what we believe, because he lives I can live. Because he lives, you can live. The disciples preached without fear about what they had seen, about what they had heard. They, they had seen. They were, they were, for the skeptics, they, they were arrested when they would preach about Jesus. They would preach about Jesus and the resurrection. They would be arrested and they would be thrown into prison. And those crazy dudes, what would they do when they would get released from prison? They would start preaching about the resurrection again. It kind of makes you think that they were on to something. That they had actually tapped into something. That they had experienced something. I, for one, learned my lesson. When I do something and it hurts, I don't do it again. They preached Jesus, it hurt. They would get released and they would preach Jesus again. Because they had seen the empty tomb. They had been there with Jesus. They knew he was the Messiah. All but one of the disciples were actually martyred for preaching about Jesus and the resurrection. I know that there are people who will give their life for things that they believe to be true... But no one will give their life for something that they know is a lie. They knew that Jesus was alive. And I want to challenge you on this Resurrection Sunday, 2023, to not see this story as folklore or an old fairy tale, but to see it for what it is. It is a life-transforming story. I want you to embrace it. 
I want you, you to experience all of the hope that Easter has for every single one of you. And I want to give you three things that Easter offers, that Easter offers to every single one of us. And the first thing that Easter offers today, you need to know this, it offers payment for my sin. It offers payment for your sin. Anybody ever had a, uh, something stolen from you? Ever had something stolen from you? Amazing how violated you feel. Now, how about this? And this is by show of hands. Anybody ever had an automobile stolen? You've had an automobile actually stolen. Every service, there's been multiple hands. Kind of a sad state of affairs. How many of you had a vehicle stolen twice? Two. Anybody had a vehicle stolen twice? Vehicle stolen twice. We've had multiple services where hands have been up. I'm thinking, y'all, you got to figure out where to park differently, buy a different car. I mean, do something different. Um, but, but we've all had, well, many of us have had a car broken into. If you had a car broken into, you had a car broken into, can't stand, can't stand that, vi- that feeling of violation. Whenever I was a teenager, my car got broke into in the driveway of my, of my, of my childhood home and in Jackson, Mississippi. I came out to go to school one morning and my car door was open. How many of you know you don't want to start your day that way? You don't want to walk out the house and your door be open. Um, and so I, I, I started looking in the car and I realized there really wasn't a, anything of great value to steal. However, they had taken something that was valuable to me, to me. And it was a box of cassette tapes, um, a collection of cassette tapes. And for the younger ones that don't know what a cassette tape is, it's how mom and dad used to listen to music uh, when we were younger. And uh, I, I, would, I, I had me in a 1981 Buick Regal, and uh, it was old when I got it, a uh, piece of junk. And, but man, I put some lipstick on that pig, you know what I'm saying? I put some shiny rims on it, and uh, I got like a, a $99 paint job and that was like peeling within a few months. And, uh, and I got me an aftermarket Panasonic stereo, and I got some subwoofers, and I pu- put them in a box and in my trunk. And it was, it was homemade, and it was never really anchored down right. So anytime I would open the trunk, the box would be laying all over the place, just hanging by the wires. But, but it, would, it, would, it would thump a little bit, you know, whenever I would put that, my jams from my cassette tapes into my cassette deck. And the joke that was on the thief, though, is that he stole a box full of Christian metal. Like the whole thing was like Christian metal. And I know I got nobody in the house that knows anything about Striper or Blood Good or any of those Petra. And nobody knows anything about all that White Heart, White Cross. Anyway, look it up. Google it. It's on Spotify. But, but, As angry as I was, I couldn't help but chuckle. And as I was praying judgment down on that thief, get him, Jesus, get him, Jesus, Jesus convicted me, and I started praying, all right, maybe he'll listen to a striper song and and get saved. I, I I don't know. But you do, you feel so violated when someone steals something from you. What Jesus said in John chapter 10, he said that the thief comes only, he called the devil the thief. He called Satan the thief. He said he's he's nothing more than a thief. He comes only. The only reason he comes into your life is to steal, to kill, and destroy. He wants to steal joy from you. He wants to kill purpose in your life. He wants to destroy families. He wants to destroy marriages. He wants to destroy your future. And the truth is, when we look around in our world, he's doing a fairly decent job. He's he's pretty good at being the devil. As a matter of fact, we could all attest to seasons in our life where he's stolen some things from us. The The way that the enemy steals from us is through something called sin. Sin, where we, where we make mistakes, where we transgress against the law of God. And anytime I preach about sinning, I know that there are people in the room in a crowd this size who want to push back a little bit um, because you probably think you're really not that bad of a sinner. Like you look at the people around you and you're like, well, I'm not as bad as they are, um, it, it, except you know, God doesn't grade us on a curve. Sin, sin, is, sin, is, sin is sin. As a matter of fact, Romans chapter 3 says, for everyone has sinned 
everyone has sinned. Look at your neighbor and tell him something you've been wanting to tell him. I want you to tell him you're a sinner. Come on, tell him, tell him. You know you've been wanting to say that. You think that they need to hear that. So go ahead and get it off your chest. You're a sinner. And I know there are others who, you've come to church on Easter. You haven't been to church since last year. And you're thinking, really? I'm going to come to church? And the, you're just going to stand up there and call me a sinner? Well, you are. I am too. Yo, we all are. We all are sinners. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, the scripture says we're actually born into sin. Like if you've ever raised a child, you understand that. You actually have to teach. You don't have to teach that child to say, no. They, they do that automatically. You have to teach them to say, yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, sir. You have, to, you have to teach them to say yes. You have to teach them to share. You don't have to teach them to be selfish because we have a sin nature. Isaiah 64 verse 6 says we are all infected and impure with sin. And when we display our righteous deeds, when like we do the best that we can on our own, they are still nothing more than filthy rags. We are all sinners, and, and this is a key, on your own, you can do nothing to improve your position. So that's the bad news. But it's Easter, so I got some good news. Jesus said in John chapter 10, Verse 10, when he said the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, I'm so glad that he didn't put a period at the end of that sentence. But he put a semicolon because there was more to the thought. He had more to say. He said, he's coming to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come on a search and rescue mission. I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. And that's the message of Easter. That's the hope of Easter. That's the joy of Easter, is that Jesus came to give you life, and not just life, not just like survival, <gasps> barely head above the water life. He wants you to have full life, a rich and satisfying life, an abundant life, the scripture says. See, since the beginning of time, there had always been, always been a sacrifice, an offering, a payment, if you will, in order to cover sin. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God killed an animal and covered, took the skin from that animal to cover Adam and Eve, to cover their sin. And throughout the Old Testament, this principle continued over and over and over. Sin was atoned for, it was paid for by bloodshed, by the shedding of innocent animals. A bloodshed, sacrifice, all of these things in order to pay for sin. And, and so, so my sin had to be Paid for. There had to be a sacrifice for your sin and for my sin. And instead of making us try to do it, which we actually couldn't even do it, because we couldn't live a perfect life. We couldn't be a perfect sacrifice. We couldn't meet the standard. So Jesus came and for 33 and a half years lived a perfect life. In fact, the scripture says he was in all points tempted yet without sin. So any way that you've ever been tempted, any temptation you've ever dealt with, Jesus dealt with the same temptation, yet he did not fall. He did not sin. He was fully God, but he was also fully man. He felt that temptation, and he met the standard, and then he died. He died to pay the price for my sins. Romans chapter 6 says that the wages of sin is death. The paycheck required for my sin is death. But God didn't say, hey, you, you, you got you to figure this out, bro. Like, you need, to, you need to do better. You just need to solve this on your own. What are you going to do about it? That's not how God dealt with it. Jesus said, I'm going to come, with, come to you. I'm not going to make you try to come up to me, but I'm going to come to you. And in 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, the scripture says, God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin. So all of my sin was accredited to Jesus and all of his perfection and his purity was accredited to me so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Have you ever had somebody pay for a bill unexpectedly? Anybody ever relieve a debt unexpectedly? 
Like I'm in a conversation with a guy like in the last couple of days where he paid for something a couple of weeks ago on a trip and I'm trying to pay him back and I'm like, bro, give me your Venmo, your cash app. And he's, he, he just said, no, no, bro, I'm not going to make you pay for that. I'm not, not going to make you do that. And I'm like, no, man, <laughs> come on, give me your Venmo. I mean, and, and I'm acting like I really want to pay him back, but I'm really fired up that he's not going to make me pay him back. You know what I'm saying? Have you ever, you ever sat down to, eat, to eat, a, eat a meal, and after the meal, you're like the waiter asking the waiter for the bill, and the waiter comes over and says, oh, sir, it's already taken care of. Someone's already paid for your, paid for your meal. There's just nothing like that vibe. I'm, I'm always thinking, I wish I had known that because I would have ordered a steak instead of a burger <laughs> if I know somebody in this restaurant was going to pay for my food. Well, this is what Jesus did for you. He paid a price. You owed it. It was your sin, it was your mistakes, but he didn't make you pay the price. He came and did it for you. In fact, Mark 10 and 45, this is the words of Jesus himself said, for even the Son of Man, talking about himself, came not to be served, but to serve others, and watch this, and to give his life as a ransom for many. He gave his life. I was imprisoned by my sin. I was shackled and captive by my mistakes. And Jesus came and paid the ransom so that I could be set free. So anytime you see Jesus, you see pictures or of a depiction of Jesus on the cross and suffering with the bloodshed, the spear in the side, the beatings by the cat of nine tails, the, these crown of thorns on his head, the blood dripping. You know what you're seeing? You're seeing Jesus paying the ransom payment for you. He paid for your sin. Can we just celebrate that? Come on, that, that is good news on Easter Sunday. That is good news on Easter Sunday. Easter also offers, secondly, it offers freedom from my past. Freedom from my yesterdays. Because even when I apply the blood of Jesus to my life and I find salvation, sometimes I still deal with condemnation. And guilt over my yesterdays. And the enemy wants you to live in your yesterdays. But I can't drive down the road staring into the rearview mirror. If I were to do that, it would be dangerous for you. Right? There's a reason that my windshield is 80% bigger than my, on average, than my rearview mirror. Because we got to look forward, ahead at what God has for us. And when God calls us into our preferred future, he doesn't expect us to consult our past. We don't have to check with our yesterdays to see if we can go where God is calling us into our tomorrows. But the enemy, he's out to steal, kill, and destroy. He doesn't want you to step into your tomorrows. So he keeps reminding you of what you did, what you did, that divorce, that second divorce. That lie, that time you lost your temper, you said that, that time you cheated, whenever you made that critical mistake, that, that arrest that is, that is on your record, he wants to continue to remind you of all of those things. But Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. How could that be? It's just how it is. Because he was wounded. I can be healed. He doesn't want you to deal with wounds from your yesterday. He went to the cross so that that wound could heal. He doesn't want you to carry the weight from mistakes in your past. No doubt there have been people in church today on Easter Sunday. And you wanted to lift your hands, but you struggled to lift your hands today. Because you're carrying weight from a mistake two years ago, five years ago, last week, last night. Whatever, you're carrying weight from it. Jesus wants to set you free from your past. And when the sun sets you free, the scripture says you are free indeed. Romans 8 says there is now no condemnation for those who belong in to, to, to Christ Jesus. Because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you. He set you free. The resurrection offers me freedom from my past. And then third and finally, Easter offers me purpose for my future. Purpose for my future. Some of you may remember 
an American athlete by the name of Matthew Emmons who was in the 2004 Summer Olympics. And he was a heavy favorite in the 50-meter three-position rifle shoot. Like he was a heavy favorite going in and he had dominated the field so far in the Olympics. So he was poised to win the gold medal and to be able to stand on the top of the podium. And he had one final shot. Like he was so far out in front, there was really no way for him to lose. And uh, in fact, all he had to do was hit the target on the final shot. He didn't dare have to hit the bullseye. All he had to do was hit the target. Like, I feel like even I could hit the target. But, but so, so he gets ready for that final shot, and he takes aim, and he holds his breath, and he squeezes off the shot and fires, and sure enough, the shot goes directly through the bullseye. Uh, he was a little bit puzzled, though, when the buzzer that generally indicates a direct hit did not sound. And in that moment, like a fraction of a second later, he realized that he had made a terrible mistake. He had done what they call cross-firing. And he had hit the bullseye all right, but he had fired at the wrong target. And so he went from winning the gold medal to eighth place because he was aiming at the wrong target. There are so many people that live their entire life chasing the wrong things, aiming at the wrong target. And you might hit it. You might have the house. You might have the job. You might have the power. You might hit it. But if that's not the target that God has for you, that is not how you win. There is nothing wrong with having all of that good stuff. But the scripture says, Jesus said, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Pursue me first and foremost. All of that other stuff. I'll add that stuff to you. But first of all, you need to aim at me and the target that I have for your life. I want somebody to understand on Easter that God has a target for your life. Like he has a, he has a bullseye that he intends for you to point your life toward. Jeremiah 29 and 11, God says, for I know the plans I have for you. God has plans for your life, for my life. Yes, for your life. Well, I can see that he has plans for you, you know, Jonathan, um, but, but for me, oh yeah, he's got plans for me, absolutely, but he's got, just like for me, he has plans for you. And, and, and I know that some people think, but yeah, I've messed up so bad, like I've made so many mistakes in my life, I'm the worst sinner in the building. Listen to me, listen to me, I'd have you look around, but it might get weird, you are not the worst sinner in the building. There's folks sitting all around you just as bad as you. There's people all over this stage today that's just made just as many mistakes as you. God still has a plan for your life. He still has a bullseye for your life. You, you might think that you, you know, you're an act. I'm not even supposed to be here. My mama called me an accident. Well, guess what? My mama called me an accident. I was the fifth of five kids. And I was, I was an accident. Uh, but they fell in love with me very, very quickly. And, and, and I've said for years, there may be some accidental parents, but there are no accidental children. There may be some illegitimate parents, but there are no illegitimate children. David said, God, before I was even formed in my mother's womb, you knew me. You knit me together while I was in my mother's womb. God has been watching you from the very beginning. And he has a plan and a purpose for your life. I've heard it said that the two most important days in life is the day that you're born and the day that you discover why. <laughs> and Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that it's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. In Christ. Outside of Christ, you're always going to struggle with why. Why am I even here? What is this all about? But in Christ, you figure that out. I want to share with you a video this morning. My name is Mike. I serve at North Rock Midtown on the worship team, and this is my story. I was handcuffed, looking at the possibility of prison, scared to death, and I remember just a small voice coming to the back of my mind saying, pray. And all I could think was, God, if you please help me out of this situation, I promise to give my life to you. And I was desperate for redemption, and my life up to that moment was marked by pain, and trauma and suffering. Um, I found out that the man that I thought was my father wasn't. And when I was 15, my mother was sent to prison. And by the age of 18, I was in a homeless shelter. 
and I felt alone and hopeless. So I turned to drugs and crime and gangs, partying. And that's when I found myself in handcuffs, praying and making promises to God. I asked him for a miracle. I had no reason to believe that he would help me, but by his grace, he did. And that officer, for whatever reason, decided to let me go. The very next day, I met a man on the street who decided to talk to me about Jesus. And it was in that beautiful moment that I heard the voice of God saying, you told me you were gonna give me your life. And I said, okay, I'm all in, Lord. And that's where my faith journey began. I started learning about God and who Jesus is, and I began attending church and learning how to serve others. And for the first time in my life, I felt true love and peace and hope. And it was the first time in my life that I felt like I had a home. I think my journey brought me to North Rock. So today I serve at the Midtown Campus and the worship team, and I believe that God has really gave me a purpose in my life to worship Him. That day, in those cuffs, I was set free in more ways than one. And even today, God continues to work on me as I continue to seek him. And I'm forever grateful that my debt was paid by Jesus and that his love has turned my pain into purpose. Come on, can we celebrate Mike's story? That's it. That's Easter. That's what Easter offers. Listen, I am convinced that... The reason some people don't give their life to Jesus, like fully surrender their life to God, is because they don't see him the right way. I believe that the enemy, for various reasons, the one who's out to steal, kill, and destroy, has caused people to buy into these incorrect ideas about God. I want to show you three quick incorrect pictures about God today. The first one is this. We see God as a wall, or, or there, a wall, I should say, between us and God. Like God is over there, and I'm over here. And this one is very frustrating, because I can't get to God. He's, he's, he's over there, I can't get to him, and a lot of people have just accepted this idea. But I've already told you earlier in the service that Jesus came. Yes, there was a wall between me and God because of my sin, but Jesus came and he busted that wall down. And now I have access to God through Jesus. So this is a lie. This is an incorrect view of God. Some people see God as, as, as it's like there's a ladder here and God's way up there and I'm way down here. And I, the only way I can get to him is to climb. And if I'll just climb, if I'll just make sure that uh, instead of reading one verse in the Bible a day, I'm reading 10 verses a day or 10 chapters a day. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. I encourage you to do that. It, it, instead of just giving a dollar to the guy on the corner who asked for money, I'm going to empty my wallet every single time. And if, maybe if I do that, I can get closer to God. I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to pay for somebody's meal in a restaurant. I'm going to treat my spouse really, really good, you know. And maybe if I'm just real good, I can, I can get up to God. The problem with this is, if I do good to get to God, um, what about when somebody cuts me off in traffic and, ooh, I just get really, really ticked off about it. Or what about when my kid comes home from school and I realize he's been hiding his report card and he's made some really bad grades and I overreact a little bit. I find myself down here. Again, and I got to just climb again. This is like really bad theology. This is a false doctrine, honestly, that the enemy would love for us to believe. Because he knows we can't climb high enough. Because he knows we got too many issues to climb up to God ourselves. And in fact, Ephesians chapter 2 says, it's by grace you've been saved through faith. It's like not of yourselves. You can't climb enough. It's a gift from God. It's not by works, Ugh, lest any man should boast. It's the gift of God. The third bad view about God is, is, is the trash can. I mean, this is a bad one. Because nobody actually approaches a trash can unless they're wanting to get rid of something that they don't want anymore. Or throw something away that is trash to them. 
picked up trash as I walked up the stairs between services and I went to the trash can and I threw it away. That's why we go to the trash can. And a lot of us think because of the mistakes that we've made in our past and the enemy telling us lies because he wants to steal, kill, and destroy, we see ourselves as trash that God can do nothing with because of mistakes that we've made, because we've wasted our best years, because we're a certain age, not, we're, we're either too old or we're not old enough that God can do nothing with our life. But I've come on Easter to encourage somebody to stop calling the treasure that Jesus shed his blood for trash. You are not trash. You are not trash. As a matter of fact, the scripture calls you his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So those are three bad pictures of God. Now let me show you how the Bible reveals God. In fact, John chapter 10, Jesus calls himself the door, the door. So let me, let me show you how this works. If, if on this side of the door is my heart, my life, who I am, I wish you could see a picture of a Savior who's standing on this side of the door knocking. As a matter of fact, Revelation chapter 3 says, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If you'll just let me in, if you'll just open up, I want to come in and eat with you. If, if, if it was in 2023 and you had a ring doorbell, Jesus' face would be in the picture. Come on, let me in. It's me. It's me. Let me in. Let me in. Let me in. I've always been amazed by this idea because if anybody should be knocking on anybody's door, it should be me knocking on his door. But Jesus in his mercy and in his grace is knocking on my door saying, come on, just let me in. I've got so much to offer you. And the moment that you realize I can't do this on my own, Jesus, I've got to have you. And you open that door and you let him in. He brings you all sorts of amazing things. He brings you freedom. Does that sound good to anybody? He's got deliverance. He's got peace. He's got hope. He's got purpose. He's got joy, fulfillment. He's got love. He's got a fresh start. All of these things just by opening up the door and letting him in. That's what Easter is all about. Let me in. I'll bring healing. I'll bring hope. I will bring deliverance to you. Would you close your eyes all over the building at every, every location? Close your eyes. How do I do it? How do I let him in? The scripture says that God presented Jesus as a sacrifice and people are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life. It's just about believing. I open up my heart. I open up that door by believing. I'm going to give you an opportunity to open up the door as we close our sermon today. At every location, if you've been feeling like trash, if you've been feeling like you need to surrender your life to Jesus, this moment is for you. Stop calling trash what Jesus shed his blood for. You are his masterpiece. He accepts you just like you are. Just like you are in your brokenness, in your sin. He loves you. He just loves you too much to leave you that way. He wants to bring you healing. He wants to bring you salvation. He wants to bring you hope. He wants to cover your sins and bring you freedom. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to take that step of faith. I'd ask for all heads bowed, all eyes closed, no one looking around. And if you would say, Jonathan, I need to surrender my life to Jesus. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. This is your moment. This is your moment don't go a day longer. Or maybe you need a fresh start today. Maybe you need to re-surrender your life to Jesus and you know it. This is your moment. So I'm going to pray a simple prayer where we're just going to open up the door and let Jesus in. And if you want to be included in that prayer, if you need to surrender your life to Jesus, will you throw a hand in the air right now? Come on at every location. Come on Midtown. Come on Bulverde. Come on Stone Oak. If you need to surrender your life to Jesus, or if you need to re-surrender your life to Jesus, hold them hands high in the air all over the building. Come on, hands up, hands up, hands up. Anybody want to join these? I want to open the door and let Jesus in. I love it. I love it. Leave them up for just a moment longer. That's it, Midtown. If you're watching online, would you just throw a hand up in that 
uh, hand emoji up in the chat box. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. All right, you can put your hands down now. I'm going to pray a simple prayer of surrender. I invite everybody to pray this along with me in your own words. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you today. I'm starting over today, and I'm making you the Lord of my life. I repent today, Jesus. I ask you to forgive me for my sins, my mistakes. I believe in you. I believe that you gave your life for me and that you rose from the grave. And today I'm making a fresh start with you. I'm making you the Lord of my life. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Can we celebrate everybody who just took that step of faith? Come on.